Welcome everyone, thanks for being here today. I know it's almost uh, holiday time. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but um, thanks for being here for the last uh, presentation of this seminar series for this year, I understand, right? Uh, my name is Marley Schleppi, and um, the talk is about uh, gifted adults and highly sensitive people. Um, I just want to say two words about my background and what I've done so far. So I um, started a, uh, a bachelor in social studies way back then. And then I decided that um, I actually liked uh, marine biology, so I went abroad and studied that instead and went all the way to the PhD. And then recently I had to get back to Switzerland, where I'm, I'm from originally, uh, for family reasons, and was investigating how I could occupy myself <laughs> with something else than marine biology, and uh, uh, started studies, uh, um, certificate of advanced studies in um, uh, giftedness. And so this study is, uh, is linked to a, a piece of work I have to hand in uh, mid-August. <laughs> so, um, and um, through uh, some of these uh, documents I was producing, I came on to one of Francis' paper that, from the seminar series and was asking how to cite it, because it wasn't published, but it was published within the seminar series, and that's how we got to talk. And uh, then um, Francis said, why don't you come and and give us a talk. So um, um, this uh, is the talk of today. Uh, are really gifted people all high, also highly sensitive? And um, the reason uh, this could be important is that uh, <clears throat> highly uh, gifted people, because they have a high potential, could potentially in our society be key people to resolve some of the social and environmental problems of the planet. And if they don't know that they're gifted, uh, or if they can't really tap into that potential, then we're kind of having a net loss of ability overall. And so um, the idea is to, to say, how could we remedy that? And some of these uh, people, of course, go through school with, without knowing that they're gifted. Now there's more and more programs and teachers that will know what a gifted child looks like. But still, uh, even with progress, and progress is slow to come, Still, there will always be people that go through schools and get out and don't know that they're gifted. And they would not even pick up a book that says gifted anything on it because they don't recognize themselves in it. So you're bound to have a portion of the population that is gifted out, out there, that is gifted, does, that they don't know that they are. And how could we catch them in a way? What concept could we use to, uh, in a way, catch them and uh, kind of bring them to a state where they can accept or recognize themselves um, into, in, into their high ability and be the most productive people they can be in their lifetime. So this is what we're going to look at today. And if I get this to work, then <laughs> I'll, bring, I'll bring you a bit to the, the path that I've followed. Click, 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 doesn't work. <laughs> um, I'll show you the path that um, I've taken to come to this idea, and um, I'll explain all the bits that are along the path, path and then, uh, look, uh, it's thinking about it, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, and then I'll look, I'll show you a bit of a study I've done, a very uh, small study. So for, I started with a highly sensitive person concept because I read a book by Elaine Aaron, book for everyone, not a scientific uh, paper or anything. And I found that this was resonating in me. I could somehow recognize myself in some of these things that she was saying. And then she uh, linked uh, the, the characteristic of the highly sensitive person to the shy ball continuum in animals. So being a biologist, that really interested me <laughs> because we have all these studies whereby you look at... Um, let's say a population of fish, and you put them in different conditions, and they will always be, always be the bold one that go and act on to, and do something, and those that are a bit more um, uh, careful and kind of look before acting. And um, it looks like the highly sensitive person would be more like the, the person who looks before acting a little bit and let the other uh, pave the way kind of thing. And they're very careful and we'll see because they have cer certain characteristics that we'll see in a minute. So then I went on and wanted to mo know more about the highly sensitive person, started reading 
uh, highly sensitive literature and I quickly came to a point where uh, all the literature I could find on this subject were related to giftedness. So um, that uh, brought me on to reading some more about it and by the time you start putting sen highly sensitive, highly high sensitivity giftedness, then you come on to a topic of Dabrowski's overexcitabilities. I don't know if you've, anyone has heard of them. No? Yes? Yeah? And uh, that's part of the, uh, a theory that Mr. Dabrowski has uh, come up with in the 60s, uh, which is called the um, theory of positive disintegration. So this is a part of that. And once you've got the theory of positive disintegration, disintegration that looks like two co contradictory words, right? Um, disintegration doesn't sound very positive. And uh, uh, those people who show signs of positive disintegration have sometimes uh, psychological problems, you could say. Uh, for example, neurosis, and um, then it leads to us to Jung's um, concept of innate sensitivity that he came up uh, came up with in the 20s, and um, he linked innate sensitivity to neurosis. And then we get back to the highly sensitive person, because in 1995, in 1997, Elaine Aron takes the uh, concept of innate sensitivity from Jung, and she uh, factors out uh, neurosis and shyness. So she comes up with the, the concept of a highly sensitive person, which is much more positive than the concept of innate sensitivity from Jung, and suddenly masses of people around the world start recognizing themselves in this highly sensitive person concept. They start wanting to make groups and hang out with highly sensitive people. Finally, feel they feel like they're being understood. And um, we've got now very many websites in all kinds of languages about this concept. Groups are forming spontaneously around the world. So never mind the validity of the scientific validity behind this concept, she, uh, she has hit a nerve, right? So with that, um, that concept there. So I'm going to take you around this circle and then show you the results I got when I did my little study. So this is Elaine Aron, of course now black on black, we don't see much of her, but she's a shy person anyway, so it doesn't matter if you don't see her too well. She's typically one of those inhibited, probably neurotic, uh, highly sensitive person, but there's also non-neurotic high, uh, highly sensitive person and extroverted highly se uh, sensitive person. So that's what she put uh, forward, that you cannot necessarily link high sensitivity with um, uh, neurosis or shyness. Um, that's where she works, New York, Stony Lab, Stony Brook. The story of her is basically that because she's so highly sensitive, it took her years to do the PhD, and that, uh, <laughs> and that uh, she, she constantly had to run to the toilet to cry a little bit. And uh, she says the only person who could bring this concept out to the world was a, must have been a sensitive person. But because the, of the characteristic of a sensitive person, the likelihood of that happening is not that high because they are more easily overwhelmed by anything that happens to them. So anyway, now we've got the concept. And she calls it, well, in, if you look it up, if you want to look at uh, research papers, then she calls it sensory processing sensitivity. And the characteristic of people that have sensory processing sensitivity is the depth of processing. And they're quick over, uh, over aroused. Uh, so the environment is quickly too much for them. They have a certain emotional reactivity and they have a high level of empathy. Some people say they condemn to be nice because they are so sensitive that if they're mean to somebody, they'll feel so bad that they'll feel more, more they'll feel worse by having been mean. By, so they just choose not to be mean because it's much less uh, hurtful to, for, to themselves. Uh, and they have a sensitivity to s a subtle stimuli, so they'll be noticing details and they'll, you know, like somebody will have a little dot on their face and suddenly they can't speak to that person anymore because the dot becomes so big to them. Something like this. No, I'm exaggerating, that's being neurotic, but uh, they will notice small differences in many situations. It, um, can you all see this? I'm not sure if it goes above the, yeah. So um, it's supposed to be a 20, 80% of the population that the group is supposed to be uh, divided into. 20% would be highly sensitive in a population and 80, the same in animal populations. Uh, they still fight about whether it's 15 and or it's whether it's 15 or 20, 
uh, they still fight in the literature over whether this is a bimodal distribution or, or um, a single, I mean, a normal distribution. Beyond the fact that um, that scholars might be fighting over this, the, the population, the people that recognize themselves in this, they're convinced that it's like this, right? Because they feel so different. They feel like also that like it's similar to gifted people. Sometimes they feel like they are an alien a bit. Yeah. yeah, this one, I, um, I pinch from a book, uh, uh, a person who's looking into this in, in German, and he was using this one from Pavlov's dogs um, experiments, and it was um, the number of, uh, it was decibels that were being measured, and how, f how quickly the person shut down according to how high the decibel was. Uh, the number of decibels. Actually, it was the dogs. I'll show you the uh, Pavlov in a minute. So uh, this is what um, that this is what El Elaine Arens uh, suggests. Bimodal, 20% of the population will be like this, and uh, some people don't agree. <laughs> um, so she made an instrument to measure this, which is called a highly sensitive person scale. In 1997, she went on and um, um, recruited a whole heap of students on campus that themselves said they are highly sensitive. And then she asked them in an open questionnaire, what are you sensitive to or how does that uh, come about, this uh, highly sensitive stuff? And then she had uh, 140 criteria or something like this that she came up with. And then it turns out that or oh, she, um, she, she did the, um, the work of... Um, uh, selecting some of these criteria because some were interlinked. So if you said yes to one, you said yes to the other. And from a hundred something, she end up with a hundred. She end up with twenty-seven question on the highly sensitive person scale. And if you score fourteen or more, you're supposed to be highly sensitive. It has internal external validity. It's a, an instrument that has been then taken by other people to do studies now. <clears throat> and uh, on the one that you use for research, you have a, a scale, like you, you don't say, you don't just say yes or no to a question, you say, let's say, um, you, you have a gradient of zero to seven, I think it goes, and you, you rate your sensitivity towards something. So for, that was the first step, and then people have taken that scale and said, this scale is not it's a construct that has several stuff in it. There's sub-factors of sensitivity, or sub-factors at least within the scale. And they, they looked into it and uh, said they, they would be one that's called aesthetic sensitivity. For one of the questions is, do you feel moved by art and music, for example? <clears throat> that would be aesthetic sensitivity. There's another one that would be ease of ex excitation. So do, do, you, do you find often that noises are too loud, Let's, for example, the movie theater, typically, <laughs> uh, is of excitation, and then low sensory threshold is that, um, for example, um, uh, you experience more discomfort when you're hungry or tired than the normal population. Let's say. So um, people have argued that there's these three different components of the HSP scale, but overall they still give a quite strong... Um, uh, uh, the HSP scale is uh, um, just as strongly uh, talking of these factors than if you take them on their own, let's say. The factors are of common uh... Yeah, exactly. So they all, so using this is not betraying what you get when you, well, yeah, exactly. And then these guys came up and, and, and proposed a two to, to, to separate the HSP scale in two factors, sensory discomfort and oriented sensitivity, and oriented sensitivity, typically these um, noticing details and things like this. Well, click. Well, I'm stuck again. Okay, here we go. Oh, so now I go too fast. Okay, so, um, it has a delay, I'm too fast, I'm sorry. Um, so then they stuck people in uh, scanners and to see if there was any difference in functional MRI pictures of highly sensitive people and then non-highly sensitive people. And that was the paper that is talking about this. They put 18 people in an fMRI and um, they asked people to 
um, detect differences between two pictures. You know what you get in a Sunday paper, two different two pictures, and if I find the, find the differences between the two pictures, they ask them to do this once with very obvious differences, and then a second time with really tiny differences. And uh, so HSP, um, highly sensitive people, showed more activation uh, in visual attention and processing, but also uh, other areas of the brain that, um, that are connected with seeking previous information, linking what they're seeing with previous information. Were, were they better at this task also? Were they what? Better. Did they perform the task better than the non uh, yeah, so, but they looked, um, they were better, but they also spent more time looking for the errors. So they, they were more interested in looking for small differences also. So in a way, if you, if you gave them the same amount of time, I guess maybe they were not that much better, but they were more dedicated to, they wanted to find the differences more. So, so anyway, all the yellow bits here are um, the bits that are, where there's a differences between the uh, standard non-highly -hi sensitive person and the sensitive person. So it's abstraction from one to the other, so wherever it's yellow, it means there's a high degree of difference between the two. <clears throat> and then they went on to another study. So this guy made a study on looking at... Um, they gave um, Asians and Americans a task to do in the MRI. And they looked at, um, uh, they had to, to draw conclusions, draw inf absolute information or relative information from the task. And um, the Americans, uh, the uh, one group was more at ease with one task and the other with the other one. So if I remember well, the Americans were better at extracting absolute uh, information, meaning able to, it's the other way. And yeah, and so then this guy did this and uh, it just turns out that, okay, there's more activation in the brain when you have to do a task that you're less comfortable with. Sounds about right, yeah? And then Elaine Aaron and, and her husband went on and looked at this again with the context of highly sensitive people and they found that uh, there's less differences um, if, uh, between two diff highly uh, sensitive people in terms of culture. That means to them, the culture is not going to be that much of a factor compared to a non-highly sensitive person. So the HSP show lower differences due to culture than the... Um, How did they know which were the sensitive people among the sample? Uh, HSP scale. They had before the experiment? Or yeah. Experiment? Yeah. So the, this, in this one, uh, Aaron was in it, but he's in the et al. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if we go on to physical kind of proofs for this, um, apart from the MRI, then you have the Scheibel continuum in animals, and she links uh, this um, to, to this field of study that's... Uh, a long-standing field of study for biologists has been, yeah, people have been looking at this in animals for a long time. And so let's say if you had, uh, you could image it that way, that if you had an aquarium with a bunch of fishes in it and you wanted to know which ones are the highly sensitive fish <laughs> and <laughs> which ones aren't, sounds funny, huh? <laughs> so you keep them in there for a long time, you give them a big aquarium than I gave them, but they're happy fish and you feed them there for quite some amount of time and then you go okay let's make the test and you start building a bridge a little uh, bridge to a new aquarium where you feed them and um, you look what happens and the 80 percent fish will just go right away because they know where the food is they smell it and they go right away and the 20 percenters will start hanging around here because they don't quite know what's around here and they will not go first to the food and they will probably miss out on nutritious food because by the time they get there, there's not much left. But on the other hand, they make sure they survive by being cautious. Uh, if, uh, if there had been a potential uh, dangerous situation there. So, um, so the, the theory would be that it's a density dependent um, uh, frequency process whereby 
There's only an advantage of having highly sensitive individual in a population if there's not too many of them. Just like if everyone knows the shortcut, there's still a traffic jam. So if everybody's highly sensitive, then you get gain nothing out of it. It's really a combination. You should really have a combination of the two types. One, because these ones, the, I mean, the bold one will um, be healthy and they'll, because they are more likely to not see all the ins and outs of a new situation, they're more likely to have good shelter, good food, and to make a population stay in good health. Um, uh, because the 20% the will always have not so good shelter and not so good food because they're kind of slow to act and they take everything into consideration. But on the other hand, when it comes to a population surviving for a long time, then you're probably better off having some 20% in there that can start pointing out to the things longer term maybe and overall the, the population would survive. So it looks like we've seen this in uh, a lot of vertebrates. But I read recently a paper that they even uh, found this in squid. So even in vertebrates seem to, some of them anyway, in, seem to. <laughs> in animals, it is a proportion also always uh, 20. Yeah, 15 or 20, something like that. So it seems that it's a kind of the, the, the equilibrium is about at that level. Yeah. So how do we go from highly sensitive person to gifted person? Well, I mean, if you, if you read uh, descriptions of gifted people, you find a lot of things that sound like a highly sensitive person. Yet, nobody's really looked into it. Uh, are they all, all the gifted people, are they all highly sensitive? So, in the past, the definition of gifted person was if you, in that uh, bracket here, your IQ is more than 130, anything there is gifted, right? So, it was solely kind of uh, decided on, on the IQ scale. And, um, and then now we've got more new definitions, multidimensional gift net mo model that say there's more things that come into it. And, um, and um, <clears throat> the, the outstanding performance in different areas are taken into account. Um, the gifted person is often Describe as a person is quick to understand, has particular interest and high dedication, tenacity towards area of interest, but maybe very low tenacity in area of non-interest. <laughs> Ability to uh, question the seemingly obvious. Uh, they have a critical thinking, excellent memory, a need for complexity and intellectual stimulation. I guess these are the things we know about gifted people. And uh, in children, it's often symptomatic that there's an asynchronous development, maybe very advanced on the cognitive side, and maybe on the emotional side, maybe not so advanced, um, or vice versa. <laughs> uh, I don't know. And uh, the, in the multidimensional giftedness models, uh, often they say um, high sensitivity is one of the is one of the key factors. But I, I, I've looked for studies on linking the two exactly, and there isn't any. So I talked to Elaine Aaron, I asked her, what do, you, what do you think? Have you written anything about this? And she goes, no, I've been asked about this many times, but I said, oh, I'd like to look into it. What do you think? And she goes, yep, yeah, I'm highly sensitive. I have to have my downtime, so I can't be uh, supervising you in any way, but I'd, I'd love to act as an advisor. So this is a budding uh, field of interest for me. So I don't know, maybe something will develop from there. At least she, um, she would be interested because she's asked this question of all the time. I think it's very obvious when you read highly sensitive person, characteristic, gifted person, there's almost the, vo the vocabulary that is being used is very similar. So, um, so that's the gifted person and the gifted person, what it is not, a person that always succeeds. Um, a child without school problems, that was maybe the past. We thought, oh, if you're gifted, then you don't need any help or any special treatment. You're gifted, you, uh, you, you succeed in everything. We now found that there's also twice exceptional children. The logo for them is E uh, square because they are gifted but have uh, learning disabilities. So these ones are likely to have school problems and also girls who uh, are sometimes hiding their giftedness. They'd rather uh, be underperforming rather than, um, than sh kind of stick out. They'd, they'd rather have friends and be like the others and um, you'll have girls that um, start school in 
at the kindergarten, they, like in read, they come back home and they start stuttering. And when the parents ask, well, why are you reading like this? Or oh, all the other children read like this. But they could read fluently before they went to school. So they actually decreased their performance to fit in, right? So they, were, they might have problems in school just because they want to fit in. And uh, a typical uh, gifted person is not a typically um, a person with typically easy or typically difficult life. It can be both. So term and studies that uh, we all said, oh, first all gifted people are really uh, asocial and they they quite they're so clever that they're really bad at socializing. And then Terman came along and did a long term study on gifted people and found that no, they're actually better adjusted than the normal. Per I mean the, the average and. They just as social and anyone as anyone, and so it seems that um, the what comes out of the, the conclusion of that would be that gifted people have a tendency that if they're going if they're well they're very they're very good they very have a very happy life and if they're bad then they really have problems so it seems that whatever they're experiencing is kind of enhanced by the giftedness it's not it's not like they have a midway between the two but there's no studies on that so we come to the overexcitabilities of Dabrowski because of course uh, somebody who's a intellectual overexcitability is very likely to be a gifted person and of course if you're a highly sensitive person then you're likely to have oops that was not what I wanted but you're highly to have a, a high um, sensorial Overexcitability and an emotional overexcitability. This is so the p part of the theory from uh, 64 from Dabrowski. He was a Polish uh, psychiatrist, did his PhD in Geneva with Piaget, and um, then uh, went on to the US after the war. He was uh, uh, put in prison several times by the Nazis, and um, he noticed during that time the lowest possible human behavior and the highest possible human behavior. And he asked himself, how can that be? How can it be that some people are really acting in the lowest possible way in difficult situations and others will be almost like saints in a way in those horrible war-like war situations? He also um, had started wanting to be a musician, if I'm, don't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and then um, he changed his orientation at university because his best friend committed suicide. And so um, he was asking himself why. And so he, he had been on the track of understanding some fundamental things about human behavior for a long time. And he uh, went to the US and his work was being translated and very badly translated. And then he met this guy, other Pol Polish guy. He was a biologist and turned to psychology after um, uh, learning of um, Dabrowski's theory, and this guy started uh, um, uh, translating his work, uh, Pechowski, and Pechowski, Michael Pechowski, um, kind of extracted the overexcitabilities from the um, theory of positive disintegration and brought them as, a, as an interesting tool in gifted education. Because you will notice uh, that, uh, well, anybody who's been in a class with gifted children, maybe one or two in a class, you will notice that they often can't stand still. And that often has to do because they're bored to death, right? So they have to get their thing going by moving all the time. Uh, they, will, they will be quite, uh, they will say, oh, well, it stinks in here. It looks like the air has been breathed already. Uh, can we open the window? Can these kind of comments. Uh, they have a high ability to, to imagine things, might even flee in that, new, in, in that world during class time if they're really bored. Uh, they, will, they will need high complexity and st intellectual stimulation, and they're very quite emotional. I heard recently a story about a girl who, um, who had, um, uh, who had uh, said that uh, um, some boys at school had uh, asked them to take their clothes off, and uh, another, another little girl who was with her was asked, is it true that you were asked to do this? And this little girl said, yes, even though it was not true, the boys hadn't done or asked that. But this little girl, who's very probably gifted, uh, also by other symptoms, 
had thought how this other girl would feel if she wasn't confirming her story. This girl who had told this lie was already a, a ostracized girl in the school. Nobody liked her. So this other little girl uh, already understood the consequences of her saying the truth. Uh, and so went on to perpetuate the lie and it made a huge school uh, hoo-ha. Uh, parents were brought into it, the, the director was brought into it and this little gifted girl suddenly didn't realize what, what she had done and what, what the consequences her, of her empathy for her little friend was. So that's what we often see in um, children. So overexcitability were a nice tool for uh, pedagogues to use with gifted children. Can you define the concept of excitability? He says um, only it's an uh, innate, innate uh, trait. Well, I will show you how it integrates into the uh, theory of positive mm -hmm. dis disintegration in a minute. Um, and then he goes on to basically describe these with um, examples. Uh, we're not talking of genetics or anything like this in terms of research. He's done, never done this, so it's all uh, observation, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Pechowski has uh, uh, made an instrument to measure overexcitabilities and code them, give them a, a weighting, and then you could um, you could say if somebody is likely to to have a development potential because you have to have overexcitabilities to have development potential, according to Dabrowski. Uh, Just stopping on the term over excitabilities, it means that those people get excited too much or more than the others in those domains. To these kind of domains. In those domains, yeah. So you're, so you're, um, yeah, exactly. So you here, you'll you'll be wanting to move all the time, or you'll if you can't move physically with your body, you'll start biting your nails or do small movement. There's something motor that you have. There's an inner, there's an inner push to act on those, on those uh, categories. Yeah. Okay, so um, the overexcitabilities come from the theory of positive disintegration. This is a big topic, but I'm going to try to give it to you in a few words. And I've made a picture for it. Um, Dabrowski says that... Um, the personality ideal is the idea that you make of yourself of how you should be. And he argues that nobody has a personality by default. You just have, you have to gain a personality. And to, to go from having no personality to having a personality, you have three factors that contribute to this. And the first factor is the genetics, the overexcitabilities. First factor being, if you have an overexcitability of some sort, you will always feel out of sync with others who don't have the overexcitability. So you will start gaining some inner um, um, uh, conflict. There will be some inner conflict. You will start asking yourself questions. The more overexcitabilities over you have, the more inner conflict you have. Um, the second factor is the environment. In a, it could be that the environment pushes you towards uh, dwelling into your inner conflict or not. And the third factor is the intrinsic motivation of a person to grow. The intrinsic motivation of a person to go from there to there. So you've got um, the level one. I think did I put this? Okay, the positive disintegration leads to the personality. So it's the, the way from there to there. So at this stage here, it's level one. It's called, it's called primary integration. You'll notice that I put some bricks, and these bricks have no white part inside. The white part in, on my model represents inner, um, what did I say before, in a um, conflict. So the people in level one of Dabrowski have no inner conflict. And you'll notice that the tiles are all pretty much the same. It's because the tiles, the, 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 the block of the personality block of these people are mostly determined by biology or uh, uh, the social environment. So in this sense, but, uh, Dabrowski says you do not have a personality if all you do is fo follow your biology and follow the rules of the environment that you live in. 
That's what he's saying. And so then, if you have overexcitabilities, you might start gaining some inner conflict because you have these overexcitabilities that start making you uncomfortable uh, to, when you compare yourself to the other people who are at level one in society. So you start seeing some uh, small levels of, um, of inner conflict in level two. And the, the bricks here start to take in a different color. That means you start um, having, you start being discontent a little bit. You don't quite know what's wrong, <laughs> but uh, he says it's a transitional stage. And um, a lot of people will have a phase like this in their lives and then go back to this one where they're nicely integrated. This is, um, uh, this one is, um, is a transient stage. And then um, depending on what happens with the environment and, and with your third factor, if you look, if you want to dwell into this, why is it that it's always too loud when I go to the cinema? Why is it that everybody's happy with this? And I'm, I find this far too, uh, too loud. Okay, I'm taking a really basic example now. If you start doing this with all your overexcitabilities, you might start um, going into positive disintegration, which is um, this stage here. You'll see there's lots and lots of white in that stage there. There are heaps of inner conflict. The bricks are all, um, all over the shop. And you start to have really bright colors. And these are the values that you have decided you want to have as a person uh, that don't belong to the values that are only given by your biology or your social environment. And these values will contribute to give you a personality, your, your personality. In this stage, the people have a strong uh, feeling that what is and what should be is totally different for them mostly, sometimes for the world as well. So what is and what should be is totally different and, it's, and it drives them mad. So they're starting to put the bricks for a new personality, but it's all in state of flux and it's uncontrolled. Um, this disintegration at this point is un not controlled. And it, this is called positive disintegration for Dabrowski because you should, um, you should be glad these people are on this stage because they'll be going up towards the personality ideal. The, the manifestation of this stage is mostly unpleasant things like anxiety and depression. And uh, in our society, often we, we see this as symptomatic and not something that we want to wish to have. So we uh, take drugs and it brings us back here. He says, uh, these people have, are on the way to something more. We need to help them, take them, let them take drugs if they need to, but we need to take them to uh, identify more of these colored bits so that they can start piling them together to go closer to a personality idea that they have, so they don't feel like they have to go back down. So at this stage, you can still go back down, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, that can still happen, and go back up at a later stage, uh, but hopefully, uh, if your environment is good and your intrinsic motivation to grow as a person, you go to stage four, and here you see my bricks are aligned again, there's still some white in between, but uh, stage four is... is um, um, is a stage where um, you, um, you, you're having a conflict but you can cope with it much better. You have your own values that are not necessarily the values of biology and society and um, you start having uh, understanding for people who are in this phase and in this phase and not find them stupid. Here in this stage you find all of them very stupid. You think that they're completely stupid to be down there, not to ask themselves the right questions, to be completely content with a small, simple life, and to not question all the big things in life. Yeah, you're very um, condescending of these people here. At this stage here, you find peace with that. You accept that there's people at all levels, and you strive for this where this is level five, and according to him, there's not that many people who are at level five. That means in all circumstances, you can be true to yourself with the high ideals of who you want to be. And mostly people who are there, it's called secondary integration. So there's only two places where you integrated. You integrated up here or here. So these are the comfortable stages. Everything in between is very highly uncomfortable. This is very, very uncomfortable. And uh, there you are in secondary integration 
and these people are mostly people that give their life to humanity and the environment. Mostly their focus in life is to give their life for others in a way. Whereas here the focus is to have shelter, food, sex. <coughs> Somebody said in a conference uh, that, but I, I, did, I was not able to verify this, that uh, the population, 60% um, of the population is here. So it's not everyone. That's why I have a pyramid, right? Because the more, the more you go up, the less people you have that reach this, and Mother Teresa might be up there somewhere. <laughs> okay, so this is um, uh, Dabrowski, and the dynamisms, uh, they are present mostly at this stage. They start here. And um, they are present when inner conflict exists, depression, anxiety, and negative effect. So anyway, that suddenly Dabrowski is the only one in the world, I think, who portrays all these things as a positive thing rather than as a negative thing. So anyway, um, the overexcitabilities have been taken out of this theory to, to be brought to gifted education. And some people are being angry about this and say, you cannot have one without the other. We don't care. Basically, the overexcitabilities tell us that there's some kind of link because you get the um, inter intellectually gifted children are represented in there, or adults, and the highly sensitive people are also represented in there. Innate sensitivity was uh, put forward by Carl Jung in 21, 1921. He called it innate sensitivity, and he associates it to introversion and neurosis, negative effect. Elaine Aaron comes back in 1997 and factors out those two things and says it's possible to be sensitive and extroverted. It's possible to, to be sensitive and not neurotic. Pavlov, 63, he talks of transmarginal, transmarginal inhibition. And um, so he, he exposes his, um, his subjects to a high level of noises, noise decibel and he looks at what point they start shutting down and he says the most basic inherited difference among people was how they reach this shutdown point and that the quick to shut down have a fundamentally different type of nervous system so he says that in well, that's 63 and Elaine Aaron finds brain differences in 2010 something like this so anyway we don't know if it's related but could be <laughs> probably we're talking of the same people and the same animals yeah so um, Aaron and Aaron recommend that um, you find out about your highly sensitive nature and um, that um, by reframing the concept she manages to put this 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 uh, characteristic under a positive light. Before, you were always neurotic, you were depressed, you were anxious. Nobody wants to say, oh yeah, I'm definitely that, right? But now she puts it in a context where, no, you have something to bring to the rest of the population. You're the fish that are quite careful and you're not being eaten by the predators. So uh, suddenly she starts having a, a big following. And she says, no shyness, no neurosis. The other researchers that I showed you before um, that those who said there's more than one concept in this HSP scale um, found that aesthetic sensitivity is um, linked to open, openness of experience, openness to experience, that ease of excitation is related to neuroticism, <laughs> neuroticism and low sensory sh threshold also to neuroticism. So that's how they... Uh, not in no, no link to that. And this guy, um, sensory discomfort is linked to negative effect and oriented sensitivity negative effect as well. Um, listed out 2008. Take these factors from here. I didn't put them in the right order. Okay, but it's the same three factors. And she tests them against other uh, constructs and she finds that Ease of excitation is related to autism symptoms, anesthesia, anxiety, depression, and low sensory threshold the same, and aesthetic sensitivity related to attention to detail, which is also a symptom of autism and anxiety. Okay, so, so it looks like HSP scale is highly linked to people with problems. People with problems we've seen according to Dabrowski on their way to a better version of themselves, and um, and uh, uh, highly sensitive people and gifted people seem to have 
this potential that they can go up this ladder from the uh, from Dabrowski. Now, as the topic sensitivity syndrome, something totally different. I didn't show you that in the first slide, but I thought if I'm on the topic of highly sensitivity, then I might as well go and uh, look a bit further. And um, this one is uh, sensitive to light. And um, so these are people who get eye strain when they read. Uh, they get discomfort or difficulty reading black text on white paper, especially when the paper is shiny. The text appears to move, rise, fall, or swirl. Uh, they, sometimes they read a whole paragraph, and they find out at the end of the paragraph they haven't understood, have understood nothing, they have to reread it. It gives problems in exams, they have to read things twice. Um, the words seem to be moving together, so you, you might have on a sheet or moving away from each other, so the, sometimes you'll have words that are doing this, and sometimes they will be doing this. Um, so it gives problems for reading, so it gives attention and concentration difficulties. And um, children or adults that like to read with a minimum amount of light might have this. So the uh, scotopic sensitivity is also uh, supposed to be 10% of the population. And that might be the kind of things you see if you have this. So this is a normal text, and if you have this, then you, it starts blurring this way. Um, oh. Okay, so that was there. And it also gives uh, spatial problems, nausea, um, motion sickness, uh, depth perception, they have problems catching balls, judging distance. These are typical people that always end up with bruises because they whack themselves in the table. They also whack themselves in window frames, so they, they're just missing, the, um, they're just missing the, the frame by a few centimeters and whack their um, shoulders. They have a restricted field of view and span of recognition, difficulty to know the last step on a staircase. They never know if they're on the last or if there's one more to come. Hesitation when taking escalators. They have a tendency to walk into you when you walk together somewhere. I don't know if you know people who do that. It's quite annoying. And uh, misjudge the position of objects, so door frame, uh, table corners. Uh, dizziness by patterns. So some will look at cobblestones and start feeling all dizzy or a big building with some lines, like maybe the the blinds of a building or something, and they start feeling dizzy. And so there's a high controversy on the reality of this. It's been tested. Some people get tested that tests that say it exists. Some people say it's all uh, it doesn't exist. And the of course there's a whole industry that offers you uh, coloured inlays, coloured. Um, colored uh, sheets of, to put over your reading so that uh, these so that the, the writing kind of settles down back down instead of vibrating or whatever so that it doesn't cost much cause like 19 euros for an overlay of the right color because they filter out some uh, wavelength and uh, for spatial problems then you, you might get your glasses tinted so that the frequency that bothers you is removed and um, people uh, uh, will say, yeah, if you, if, you if you listen to people who have had s problems and they suddenly they get their glasses, it's a whole new life for them. So they stop being dizzy and all of this. But science-wise, it, it hasn't been validated. But my, I was wondering, if you're sensitive to stimuli from the outside, could it be that you might also have a, a better ten more of a tendency to be uh, to have this uh, scotopic sensitivity syndrome. So that's why I put it in there. So now, how does giftedness and high sensitivity relate? If we, have, if we, if we agree that we have 80% of non-sensitive, non-highly sensitive people and 20% of highly sensitive people, then um, is it that gifted people are in this box? So all gifted people are not highly sensitive, which could be an option. Could it be that they're all up there? So this is what you so seem... 2% are the highly gifted. Mm. Yeah, 20% is uh, highly sensitive, 2% of the population is um, highly uh, gifted, uh, intellectually gifted, let's say, yeah? The one we can measure with the IQ. What is in the first column? It's the same thing, but the gifted people are in the non-sensitive population. Mm. Or is it that we have something like this, where the, um, the gifted could be highly sensitive or not highly sensitive. Yeah, so there's no way in the literature to find out about this. Everything you read is more like looking like this one, 
But nobody has ever, I mean, I, I haven't read any one study that shows this clearly. There is no relation. Those are alternatives. Mm -hmm. There are alternatives. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know it yet. So I was thinking, okay, that interests me. I don't have much, uh, I mean, my study is a really mini study. It's just not a highly significant study. But I thought, yeah, yeah, let's, let's look into it with a bunch of people uh, that I can get my hands on. So I'd, I have a pretty pitiful N, but uh, still, I thought so I'll do it anyway. Uh, so um, and the significance is that, what, what do we care if uh, highly sensitive plus, uh, gifted people are highly sensitive or not? Well, in children, it could be that if uh, you could early identify the uh, uh, twice exceptional or the gifted girls, or even children with migrant background uh, who might be gifted, because uh, if you went and said to teachers, instead of looking for gifted people, you just look for your highly sensitive kids in the class. It's 20% of your class. You're likely to have four to five children that are highly sensitive in your class. Keep an eye on them. It could be, become a standard thing, diagnostic tool in, ch in classes that teachers are taught to look for these children. And within them, you could start looking for those with scotopic uh, sensitivity, so those that might have reading problems, and you could look for your highly gifted child in case they might, you know, if you can say they're all in there, then that's where you start looking. Um, you could ask, uh, so if you, um, if you identified your highly sensitive and maybe gifted children, then of course you can give them a corresponding school curriculum. You can ask, you, there's, a, I don't know if you heard of the Bloom taxonomy, which is, I mean, basically what happens is if you have a gifted uh, child in a class, you don't want to give them the program for next year to do, even though they could do it, because next year they'll have nothing to do. And if you keep doing this, by the time they're one year between finishing their school time, they'll have nothing to do because they, they would have done everything already. So the Bloom taxonomy is a, is a method to complexify the material that you have for that year, but make it more interesting and um, kind of uh, yet challenging for uh, gifted children. So if you, if you knew how to diagnose your gifted children without necessarily sending the whole class to do an IQ test, but you could say, oh, where are my highly sensitive children? And then out of that, mm, is there any uh, gifted child among them? Then you could po possibly uh, also uh, give your uh, child in that class something more interesting to do. Uh, you could offer psychological support uh, if necessary. And you could diagnose, uh, maybe uh, send them to get tested for this if they have uh, learning disabilities. Reading mostly is problematic. In adults, you could tame the undiagnosed gifted adults. I gave them a name, Ugas. Um, these are those that <laughs> go through school, they never, never, nobody ever thinks that, think, think that they're guilt, uh, gifted, but they are, and uh, often because they have some problems in their lives and it's not going the way they want, they are very unlikely to think that they're very intelligent. They think they're quite dumb in many cases, actually, have low self-esteem. And uh, they would never pick up a book where it says uh, gifted adults uh, and something. They would, not, they would not think it's them. And if they thought it's them, they would never dare picking it up and be seen at the cashier with it uh, by the fear of somebody thinking, who does she think she is? Something like that. So they won't pick up those books. So why don't we catch them with another concept? So if high, high sensitivity is related really to... A giftedness, you could start catching them that way and kind of bring them to think that, yep, they've got something a little bit different happening there. And so after this, you could target, um, give them targeted coaching if they needed any, and uh, to learn to recognize their strengths and their abilities and all that, and uh, recover lost potential to solve societal and environmental issues through their contribution. Because by the time they feel better about themselves, they they realize they can actually bring something to society, they might decide to do something that might change the world. Who knows? <laughs> so this is the significance. So um, that's another way to put it. Gifted person, cost and benefit. This is a normal person. When she's uh, at the best of she can be, she's there. When she's at the worst, she can be, she's there. She, that's the difference between the two is this. And a gifted person, at the best of she can be, is she's here. At the lowest, she's there. And the difference is more. So basically... Um, if you have a person like this and you can bring them back here, 
to, uh, through some concept that is not talking about giftedness, well, you, you get, this is your gain in terms of contribution to society, let's say. All right, mini study. So, I, I've got seven participants, four males, three females. I basically wrote to the Mensa. Mensa is the club that you can belong if you have an IQ more than 130. So you go and do the test. If you, if you, if you have an IQ more than 130, you, become, you can become a member. Or you go to the psychologist and get tested there, and you can show the Mensa that you're smart. And then you, <laughs> and then you go into this club. And so I wrote to Mensa Switzerland and said, hi, I'm interested in this topic of high sensitivity and giftedness. At least I knew that they all were more than 130 IQ. And uh, so the volunteers, they just contacted me themselves and said, yeah, I'd like to take part. I asked them uh, how the IQ was. So that was one of the questionnaire things. I'll get them to take the HSP scale, highly sensitive person scale. Uh, Elaine Arena has also made another instrument called sensation seeking scale. Um, uh, so it seems that um, because she found out that they can, you can be highly sensitive but not always shy, um, then, um, then the corollary is that you, you might be high sensation seeking and highly sensitive, which is a bit of a difficult combination because you're always lo looking for novelty, but at the same time when there's too much you're overwhelmed. So these people don't have an easy life. <laughs> Um, so um, I took, I put this one as well. This one is not validated properly yet. This one is. Um, this test is uh, not validated either. It's a set of questions, so it's all self-evaluation uh, that you can just just answer a questionnaire, and you can score the, the questionnaire. Definition response instrument. This is a validated test uh, by Pechowski and this guy, um, which tests whether you have signs of positive disintegration. This is a, an open questionnaire with some standard questions, and then you score the, the answers. Um, and then I gave them a self-assessment of uh, intro-extroversion. I asked them, do you feel more introverted or extroverted? Give me a percentage on the two. And uh, self-assessment assessment of childhood, easy or difficult, because Elaine Aaron seems to say that, um, that um, this is a, a big factor in a highly sensitive person who don't... Um, who don't live their high sensitivity in a good ways because they had a difficult childhood. So, I, so this is this what they, they were asked. And uh, so there's a, you can see the problems with this mini study is that the sample size is not valid. Uh, the, men's, the people were volunteers. So the ones who, who said yes are probably likely to be highly sensitive. Otherwise, I, I can hardly imagine somebody really not highly sensitive wanting to take part in a highly sensitive study. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I have no control group because I, I don't have the means to go and get random people tested and ask them. And uh, most tests were self-assessment, so we know the problem with self-assessment between what you think you are and what you are is two different things sometimes <laughs> that can be clearly seen on internet uh, sites when you go dating or something. <laughs> what people think they are is not always what they are. And, uh, and but, okay, but never mind. So the results are like this. So uh, if you look at IQ and HE scores, I put a line through there just quickly, and uh, you get a really weak uh, positive relationship between the IQ and uh, HSP score. There was a, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so. but uh, you wouldn't expect the high correlation because anyway, they all have a high IQ score. All, uh, yeah, but you have a hundred. You have a, you had a hundred thirty to hundred forty-five or something. Yeah, and if there's little variation, you will not find much correlation. Mm. So you should compare to the average level of sensitivity in the average population. Mm. Yeah. But so I was thinking maybe if you you did this at a, a big scale, you might be able to see something. But uh, yeah, what were you saying? Do you know what average HSP scores on average? Uh, HSP? Uh, general population. Ah, yeah. Um, no, because, uh, yeah, good point. I'd, um, the, what we know is that under 14, but we don't know the average, but I'm 14, you're not, mm -hmm. uh, over 14 you are. But here I gave them the other one, which is the rated one, the, the graded one. So, um, no. So that's, I mean, I need a control group to, to know what... Uh, but there must be, in the literature, there must be some studies where they have applied that scale on unknown 
uh, uh, populations don't bias to like final. Yeah. How do they do the studies usually with university students when they only have a higher IQ? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was one of the uh, criticism for uh, Aaron and Aaron in 1997 by the other ones that came subsequently and, and looked at the subscales that there were the the, val the sampling was not necessarily valid because they were all smart uh, university student already. Mm. Uh, sensation seeking and HSP. So it looks like if you're uh, high, I mean, the more uh, sensitive you are, the less likely you are to be sensation seeking. Again, very weak, but uh, yeah. So there'll be maybe it's not a continuum. Maybe you'll have mostly people who are non sensation seekers which uh, would correspond to what Elaine Aaron says, and some that are uh, sensation-seeking. And then uh, if you look at uh, highly sensitive and scotopic sensitivity, there's some kind of relationship there. So, um, so if you're highly sensitive, there's a chance that you have this sensitivity to light that uh, uh, disables you when you read and in your spatial relations, uh, spatial um, uh, yeah, spatial ability basically. So a highly sensitive person is likely to be susceptible to have a scotopic uh, sensitivity. Well, many studies results, those with the highest IQ gave a high score of introversion, but only one also gave a medium score, so we cannot say the more, the more IQ you have, the more introverted you are. Doesn't seem to be, but of course, with the sample size you can't say much. Um, so one with 135, which is not well, it's high, but it's not uh, 145, then he also had only a medium uh, level of introversion that he gave us. Positive disintegration was seen at high level in two of the participants, intermediate level three, and not at all at two. So it could, uh, so because you're highly gifted doesn't necessarily mean that you're, that you're, um, that you lost yourself questions and be dissatisfied with yourself and want to be a better person apparently. <coughs> Sensation seeking was not related to extroversion because um, it could be that you say okay um, so you get some kind of sensation when you meet new people and you are in big groups but it looked like it wasn't necessarily the case and there's no pattern between the HSP score so highly sensitive score and childhood self uh, um, self self-assessment so uh, it's not like if you're the most sensitive you'll have you'll be uh, you'll have a bad childhood so it's more it looks more like if you're highly sensitive if you have a good environment you'll be very happy if you have a bad environment you'll be really unhappy something like this conclusion so there are grounds to think that maybe IQ and high sensitivity are somehow linked it's a weak relationship but you pointed out the flaws to, of this um, the three sub-factors of the HPSP scale made uh, relate to IQ differently. The three factors that other authors have brought up. Um, sensation seeking is likely to be absent in highly sensitive people with, um, hmm? with a high score. Uh, high sensitivity could be used to detect scotopic sensitivity probably in pupils. So in 20% of the class then you'd have to look for those with reading difficulty and try these overlays. Cheap as cheap, 20 euro for an overlay. You could have, there's about five or six, I think. You could have some in the classroom and see if uh, these children can start reading when you put an overlay on them, on the, on the sheets, or start printing your um, schoolwork on uh, non-white sheets and see if the child can read better. Um, uh, highly sensitive as a lump concept, so as Aaron defined it, may not be a good enough predictive tool to detect a high IQ. And um, high IQ does not necessarily say anything about an easy or difficult childhood um, or about being in positive dis disintegration. So, of course, the results are a bit uh, mitigated by the end factor. So now is the time to open the discussion. In conclusions all together, a lot of it, so uh, I would say... Uh, yeah. yeah, inconclusive would be the word, I think. It's a little experiment, but don't pay too much attention to it. It's just too small. Yeah. And so just to, fi to finally, we've got a... If anybody is interested in uh, giftedness, uh, Swiss Giftedness Congress uh, in September next year, mostly in German and English, and... Uh, 
trying to fight for a French session as well. So in case you find somebody who's interested in coming along, it's mostly with the uh, uh, Austrians who got the Congress in uh, 19, uh, this year and in 2016, and the Germans, here you can hardly see it, ICBF, who had it last year and uh, will have it in 2015. Yeah, so that's it for me. Open time for questions. <laughs>